Welcome back to another Q&A, where we sit down with the directors behind the original Natural World stories included in our 2022 official selection. Today, I'm joined by Tom Hanna, director of The Caretakers, to discover more about the enthralling world of beetles. So, Tom, where in the world are you joining us from today? London. Yeah, corner from sunny London, thank God, because it's been absolutely chucking it down recently. <laughs> it's the autumnal weather. <laughs> yeah, not exactly great still going out walking wildlife, eh? So could you could you give me a brief overview of your experience so far prior to directing The Caretakers? So I went to the University of Southampton and studied marine biology because a long story short, it's one of those topics where everyone was doing zoology. Everyone was like doing these sort of like sexy subjects looking at like <laughs> jungles or tundras and all sorts of stuff. And when I was looking for courses, I always like, I was more or less on the fence about it but then one day I saw a quote from Alistair Fothergill that we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our oceans and something like that just really piqued my interest and was definitely that sort of the deciding factor of doing marine biology. As I progressed through that course I was become more and more accustomed to how scientists tell stories, how we, it's our duty to sort of tell the public or tell our audience the clearest, most succinct story. But then throughout that, that was really good training because as a scientist, you don't always achieve that because a lot of like big words get thrown around, a bit of like jargon here and there gets thrown around. And for me, it was it ended up being something that I didn't quite want to, to do in mm -hmm. terms of the, for the storytelling aspect of that wasn't as clear as I wanted. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So after I graduated from Southampton, I then was sort of doddering around, doddering around a bit, trying to decide what I wanted to do. Then suddenly I thought, no, I want to pursue my dream of being a rather filmmaker. I've always wanted to do it as a kid, but I never knew how. And then luckily I got to a filmmaking MA at Beckinsale, the National Film and Television School, mm -hmm. and was able to like actually like practice. And that's the one thing I wasn't able to do as a marine biologist, is practice my filmmakers. We just didn't have time. Was at NSCS. They basically just like didn't hold our hand at all. They're just like, right, here's a camera, <laughs> off you pop, go tell a story, wildlife story. And for me, at first, that was really daunting. But now, in hindsight, I really, really appreciate it because then it gave me the vital time and that I could focus on myself as a director, as a camera person, or as a producer. All these like vital skills that we also have to carry forward into the wildlife film industry. So yeah. Okay. That's, that's really interesting then. So you've gone you've gone from the scientific background into the sort of storytelling, but you've also brought with you, I'm assuming, the sort of research skills and, and the passion for um, different organisms and looking a bit closer at, at the world. Yeah, definitely. Because because this this is the, the <laughs> this is the great thing about the scientific world is that there are so many brilliant discoveries being made day in day out. But the great tragedy of it all is. The average member of public's not going to hear about them unless like say like be news or someone else like grabs it as a headline and this isn't me like bashing the, the science <laughs> the scientific world before I, before I say this but often cases with this new research you have to pay like a fair amount of money just to read a paper on it and even when you and even when you access a paper you then got to digest all the terminology and all the like some really dense words, long words at that, often case, mm -hmm. in order to interpret it. And the average member of public isn't going to be able to do that, which is why like filmmaking is so important, because you are almost taking this information that you found in papers as a researcher or whatever, and then applying that to film. And then suddenly people can learn about these animals, can learn about what we're doing to our planet and what's going on. And you know, all these like different amazing places are suddenly like understandable. I think that I think that's the, the key word is that just making things understandable and approachable. Um, I think I think I read as well in your bio that you've you'd had some prior experience with wild screen. I just wanted to ask if you if you wanted to delve into that. <laughs> After graduating from university, I was like, just pottering about, just doing like you know jobs, just trying to like pay rent and stuff like that. You know, the classic early twenties story. <laughs> but then what actually set me on, on my path is like I saw wild screen. And like you guys were asking for volunteers, and then something just clicked in my mind, thinking, "Hang on a minute, like, should I go to this? Should I like volunteer? Should I at least try and get some contact, even though I didn't have a clue, a who anybody was really, 
and B, I had absolutely no experience in the wildlife film industry. So I was a bit like, but I took that leap of faith. I applied for, to volunteer at Wild Screen as, I can't remember what it was. It was like a, not a journalist, but like, we, it was a reviewer. That's it. We, I was hired ah. as a reviewer, which is in, really interesting job anyway. Uh, because we got to go like, in a part of a team, we got to go to a lot of separate events. So, like we divvied it up, but then that was a fantastic way to then suddenly go. Oh, okay, I can actually like go to this event and meet that person. And for me, like volunteering at Wild Screen was brilliant because, crikey, like the amount the amount of information that you sort of like been thrown at you, but like oh, and but the greatest thing as well when you talk to these people these people being like, you know, the talent execs or the camera people that are visiting. But you basically absorb as much of the advice as possible that you're given. Mm -hmm. Away from it thinking like, oh, okay, I've given them my really crap business card. I'm probably not, I'm probably not gonna hear from them regarding a the job, but the advice they give me at the time is completely invaluable. I mean, my own personal experience is that I met one of the talent execs from the BBC and they've been they've been a fantastic teacher throughout my entire wildlife career since that every time i've bumped into them or every time i've spoken to them they've always given me like fantastic sage advice um that's some that somehow like may maybe like who i am today about being cliched about it because everything that they've told me is has been true and everything that they've told me to say has helped me out um and it's amazing because um, Wild Screen this year had a few people from my old like film course who who volunteer and asking for advice and saying, uh, "Should I do it?" And I said, "A hundred percent, do it because you a you, you just don't know who you're going to meet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it might end up changing your right. life. So yeah, that's that that that's for me that that's the one best thing about like being at Wild Screen when I volunteered there, as well as like making lots of friends. I mean, it is. It's crazy, like all the people that I volunteered with, like there's a fair few of them now that are pretty, pretty, pretty big characters in the in the sort of the social media world or you know in the world of filmmaking world and stuff. So yeah, it's it was a really really cool place to volunteer. I I saw in your as part of your press pack, you mentioned that um, focusing on the world of Beatles, you obviously you had an understanding of the Beatle world as we all did, but there was something that kind of got you to to want to drive deeper to understand why they do what they do and how they do it with the particular reference to that um the dung beetle and you know i think it was mentioning you know how does it navigate why does it do this um what what sort of created that interest in you to go from um researching marine biology to then looking at beetles so yeah that's a good question actually because as a as a marine biologist you'd have thought i'd, I'd obviously stick to my niche <laughs> but when I said marine biology, that didn't stop me from loving the natural world as a as a whole. Like, like I said, marine biology for me was just my way of discovering something something that's a bit more mysterious. Mm -hmm. But while I was doing that, I was doing like, zoology modules. I was like trying to like deep dive into as, as much like zoology and broad like natural history as possible. And so for me, like wildlife filmmaking was a reflection of that because prior to like prior to the caretakers my original idea was going to be a marine based film like on humpback whales and sort of the amazing story of them returning to new york city uh because of, because basically because it, they've actually cleaned up the rack they've literally cleaned up the rack so well <laughs> that these massive beasts are coming back to the hudson bay i thought it's an amazing idea but then the classic covid happened and we we're told you've got to have a uk idea and I know I wasn't anyone that struggled at first because you sort of think, okay, what can I do that's different in the UK? Not a lot. It's been kind of been done a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but then, I mean, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but basically I was on Google Images one day, just like researching ideas, when suddenly I saw one of those like stunning pictures of like the Beatles mounted on a white background, for muse like museum Beatles mm -hmm. mounted on a white background. And the, f the first thing that jumped out at me was the colours. I mean, the oh my God, it, I mean, orange, oranges that you've never seen before, like greens, like greener than green. And immediately, I think, like, right, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to, like, almost look at... At first, it was like, I want to celebrate 
the colors of Beatles, but then obviously that evolved into celebrating Beatles as a whole as a like mm-hmm. went further down the rabbit hole of like researching Beatles. And like I said, because I'm not an entomologist, I, like, I mean, to be perfectly honest, at the time I would pretty much stay, stay clear of insects as a whole. Like, <laughs> I mean, I love, I mean, like, like you've got the humble ladybird, for example, mm-hmm. like little beetles like that, that I loved. But I never ever wanted to like sort of dip my hand in some like into the undergrowth and see what I could like drag out that's crawled onto it. So for me, like be, that the caretaker was, was almost <laughs> was almost me trying to say to myself, no, give them a chance. And then as I did, then obviously that, that just evolved into like a massive love for them. And then I could almost say be also like a gateway drug to insects as a whole, because like because now like whenever I see a creepy crawly I'm like you're not creepy at all you're absolutely wonderful for me one of the one of the key reasons why that was so effective I think was through the visuals um so there was such visual flair in your in your across your film but particularly I think at the beginning where where you're where you've got that lovely white background and then the colors of the beetles just pop um and they're kind of appearing in different ways um I understand as well you were the director and cinematographer so you had control over that uh, visual style. Um, what, what were your visual inspirations for this? What, what, what did you set out kind of hoping to, to incorporate into your film? For me, I felt like, okay, so what's gonna be the greatest way to drag people in and, make, and actually like pique their interest? And for me, that was definitely the visuals because that's why like throughout, I've, I tried to scatter these white background images. It's like when I did the metamorphosis sequence, Mm-hmm. where you have the larvae like popping up that was just a random idea that pops up in my head one evening because my mum has these big flower pots at home and quite a few years ago I realized that they're teeming and I'm, I'm like, like teeming with a capital t with beetle grubs like uh, rose chafer grubs and it got to the point whenever like my mum and she still has them and even when my mum's like digging them up I said like can you please be careful I don't really like killing <laughs> These, these grubs because I think it's like you pull them out and there'd be all these like various stages of their development and that's why like the idea came from oh I can actually like I can physically go from like a late stage lava to a early stage lava and put them on a white background because I felt like if you just start off the sequence with an image of just a lava just like plodding about in a bit of mud that's not that's not telling you the information that you need to need to know about them. Um, so you mentioned as well how you originally maybe were a little bit squeamish around insects um but i i read that you actually ended up having some living in your kitchen Is yes that- so if anybody like knows the the process when it comes to like macro cinematography often cases you have to bring your subjects back to you to set because it's, otherwise it's just impossible to do it in the wild and in, in the mm-hmm. right amount it's like weather might be rubbish light conditions might be rubbish you know all these other like, factors against you so it just makes way more sense to build a, a living set and have it with you. So I made the caretakers when it was slap bang in the middle of COVID, mm-hmm. um, like the first lockdown. And so obviously like getting out wasn't feasible enough. So I basically had this like menagerie of beetles all over my kitchen, much to like sort of the disdain of like <laughs> friends and family who like would see it and stuff. And um, I, yeah, I, just, I mean, I just got so used to like cooking breakfast, like having breakfast, like making toast while I had less stag beetles munching a bit of banana or <laughs> had a longhorn, a really angry longhorn at that uh, in its little enclosure, um, just basically staring at me, like hating me. I said, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll film you and then I'll dump you somewhere decent in the woods. And um, <laughs> And it was bizarre because then, because obviously like with COVID lockdown, it was such a lonely time for so many people because it was all so isolated. Yet weird enough, having those beetles in like in my kitchen were were company. Not that I was, not that I was mad enough to like start speaking to them and confide in, in them or anything like that. But you just, you, you just, it was just kind of comforting knowing that, oh, I, I was in this, I was very, very busy in this process with these beetles as sort of house guests and i mean like the the, the longest tenants i had were my um my superworms while they're eating polystyrene i mean 
They're in my kitchen in Polisarian for about three, four months to the point where okay. I just, I, to, where's, to the point, like, I mean, they're in the bowl eating the Polisarian. I just left them there on the side, not really caring too much about them. In, in a horrible way, but more like I didn't take notice of them in the end because <laughs> I got so used to them. I, I think I read as well that you ended up having access to the um, Natural History Museum collection of beetles. How did how did that come about? Because that sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Oh, being being in the Natural History Museum, looking at all these specimens as a filmmaker is a privilege. Mm -hmm. So they're like you you go down this alcove, down this hole that you've been down a million times as, as a kid in a museum, and then suddenly you're faced with this vast and I'm I'm the same like this vast library of lockers and folders and whatnot of i can't remember what it was at the time i think there's like either three million or ten million beetles i mean again just trying to get your head around that is mine either either number is huge <laughs> it's absolutely massive and the fact that max said to me right you i'm i'm finishing work at 5 30 you've got you've you've got free reign and so it's like oh oh my god and because my original idea was i was going to almost like stop motion the sequences of the white background where it's like I was going to take the beetle keep filming and then just edit it later on but I thought no I've got a, I've got a decent stills camera if I want to like really get these colors popping I would like to take photos so I set out to work I was like Mouse wants this like cork board which luckily was white and um <laughs> I mean I don't know how many I must have gone for about like 300 beetles at least just like panicking like going up like smash smash and um, at one point, and this is where the, like, I felt especially privileged, is that Matt, I said to Max, oh, do you have any of Darwin or Alfred Russell Wallace's Beatles here? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah come with me. And he show, he'd show, actually show me these, um, they're called plates, these like wooden like sort of folders with the polystyrene in and stuff. And he showed me this particular plate that Darwin had made himself uh, on one of his voyage when he was on the Beagle. And oh. the fact... And like so many beetles were stunning anyway. So I was able to like take them out and photograph them. But the fact that I was handling beetles that Darwin himself and Wallace himself, I mean, some of the Wallace's stuff from Asia was well, was amazing. I mean, like, you know, you had the rhinoceros beetles and your ginormous longhorns and stuff like this that Wallace himself had found and mounted on this board. And for me, I was really giddy, but especially about Wallace because um, I went to a state school um that Wallace went to when he was a young lad and I, I even my like house that how I was sorted into but very Harry Potter-esque way of putting it was Wallace house so for me like being able to look at what something that my childhood hero had made and his really famous voyage to the Malay archipelago was just another incredible aspect of making this film it's just yeah and it's very, very full circle then isn't it from your oh your... 100 yeah dreams as a kid to one day do wildlife filmmaking to then be making a wildlife film holding these these specimens Must oh 100 yeah that's that's, that's i mean that, that's that's what made this fi that film the caretaker so special because like i said it was a learning curve for me in terms of like loving a new group of wildlife but also getting opportunities like this to like you said that almost come full circle but yeah it's it baffling but amazing I know you've mentioned a few funny moments with the Beatles. Were there any um, moments uh, that were just your favourite out of all of sort of pre-production and production? One particular moment. I mean, not so much as like the fun side of things, more like you're just in the moment and you're just appreciating how gorgeous it is. Is that there's near like home home for me, like when where I grew up, is the all these fantastic like lavender fields, like like um, like proper fields filled to the brim of lavender. So like. You're in the sea of purple, basically, as you're walking through. Oh. The smell's incredible. You're half deafened by the buzzing of, like, millions of buzzing bees. But then as you sort of, again, sort of the main thing about the caretaker, it, just look a bit closer. When you look a bit closer into this lavender field, suddenly you've seen the, the, the rosemary beetles. Mm. And the rosemary are the, these wonderfully metallic and colourful little things that when you look at them, you think, Oh my god you actually see a reflection in them they're that shiny and this is what i mean what we're talking about right at the beginning about the colors of beetles being like the main inspiration and <laughs> for me at some point i had to get a rosemary beetle in and then when it came down to the edit when it came to like putting all this together 
<laughs> it basically was just this process of like, okay, can I get this beetle? Or can we squeeze this one in? You know, <laughs> can I get as many of them in as possible? Uh, and actually, it actually got to the point that during the edit, I almost wanted to make it that I never repeat the same beetle twice when I'm going for the sequence. Like, so every single sequence, every time I talk about a beetle, I never wanted to repeat the beetle. So I wanted to just basically just to help like demonstrate that like, how vast and like, how huge a group of animals they are. Yeah, definitely showcase the biodiversity of, of the fact that you can talk about one um, part of their body or composition, but you could show five different um, examples of that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, but in terms of like stand up moments, like there's just way too many. There's like, like I said, like when, when, when you're doing this and learning about them as you do, like you just, the old stand up moments are fantastic. So. Oh, no, that's, that's a good tip. Um, are you working on, I know, I understand you're currently working with um, BBC. Are you, are you working on any other projects sort of behind the scenes or personally that you can talk about that um, are following up the caretakers? Yeah, so, so I went to Wild Screen this year, and obviously it's the first time that it's been properly in person because of COVID. And I, I, was, I was saying this with like some of my friends from my film course who were also there. I was like, I sp- like when you're part of the official selection, especially, and like, when you're like brushing shoulders with all these fantastic filmmakers who are making short films or long form films, whatever, and just the whole atmosphere. It, selfishly it kind of made me think oh, man, I, I just want to make a film so I can come to it again and, and experience this again as I have done and so it's definitely put a bit of fire in me to make it <laughs> and I think it's I think it's long overdue that I make the film that I was meant to make to begin with the humback film so <laughs> So definitely, uh, when when I get a bit more time with the beat, like with the project I'm working on BBC, when I get a bit more, bit more time, I'm definitely going to start planning to do that because yeah, that, that's a story that definitely needs telling as well. well. That's a very exciting teaser for for your upcoming project. So it's humpback whales in in the in the Hudson in New York, New York City, and then slap bang in the middle of New York City. Like it's getting to the point now where you can see breaching whales, and you have like the One World Trade Center or the Chrysler Building in the backdrop. And suddenly, like you think, <laughs> it's me. Like it's almost like the Beatles. Like you, you, you just don't know this is happening. You just don't appreciate that this is something that's actually happening in our natural world. Yeah, it's quite bizarre. It's, it's also quite. I, I like that. I, I like the idea that you're going from something so small um, to so <laughs> <laughs> something so massive. Yeah, <laughs> back whales. <laughs> um, but no, that would be really exciting. Definitely, let us know uh, when you've got any any teasers for that coming out. <laughs> yeah, gladly. Um, and through, through Wild Screen Festival as well, um, we often like giving the opportunity for people to do a call out if they're looking to connect with anyone in particular, whether that's commissioners or researchers or um, even people who just love Beatles and, and want to chat more about it with you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask if there was anyone who you particularly would like to connect with. Um, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, like, if there's anybody, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about like, from a production company standpoint, I mean, if there's, if there's anybody that is considering going down sort of the Green Planet route, you know, obviously, like Green Green Planet is a fantastic modernization of the life, the private life of plants. You know, Dev Asin Brazil mm-hmm. and CV series, and watching that and seeing what they've managed to get you know achieve in terms of that storytelling with the camera gear that they had and but also the, just the stories in general i mean there's, i mean this is the the plant world is a phenomenal place to get all these like, fantastic stories and i th- i think insects are very much due their kudos Ooh. and i'm almost like wanting someone to modernize life in the undergrowth which is another like famous Attenborough series that focuses on insects i think insects are long overdue and I've I've worked with people in the past that I've mentioned this to, and they're, they're a bit like, oh, insects just don't sell or insects aren't sexy. And I firmly disagree with that. I just think like you you you, t- you, you tell their story right, and it's going to get people to come listen and come watch and stuff. So like, if there's anybody 
out there that wanting to like do then yeah that, that, that definitely would love to connect with them but also i guess i'd love to connect with just people who are just starting out because mm. i when i was starting out i i didn't have a lot of advice i had to like pretty much work out a lot of it out myself and, and obviously like when i worked at wild in 2018 that was fantastic like i said because i got to actually ask these questions but so if there's anybody that is you know wondering about taking that next step wondering what they should what should they do on how they should do it then 100 like just contact me i'm i'm very much an open door person that's good to hear um if anyone if anyone does want to reach out what's the best way to uh to contact you so instagram uh instagram. email stuff like that yeah just really stuff like that so Ooh, we can put your instagram handle in the video description below so anyone can uh yeah. can click through and, and, and get in touch if they want to um, perfect that's that's all my questions for today. Thank you very much for joining me, Tom. Um, all right, thanks for having me. No problem at all. Um, it's been fantastic to learn more about Beatles and all of the, I guess, the, the whole journey that you went through to make this film and and give the Beatles the platform and the PR that they deserve. <laughs> they absolutely deserve it. Honestly, they are the most important animals on the planet, and the more people that realise that, you know, the better off we'll be. The Caretakers will be available to watch on demand on our film library until the 16th of December for Festival Delegates. Details on how to purchase your own virtual pass are in the video description below.